I am very happy to be here with you as we explore this intersection of native plants and native cultivars and their appeal to pollinators. So before we begin, I would like to take just a few minutes to set the stage. We're going to be exploring plants and pollinators in our designed landscape, but let's step back for a few minutes into time and go back like a couple hundred years at least. So if you will, get in your time machine with me um, and we'll go back to, oh, let's say approximately 1522. Recent events that you may recall, given the year, um, would be that the Aztec Empire surrendered to the Spanish Empire. Martin Luther had just posted his 95 theses and has thus begun the uh, Protestant Reformation. Uh, Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan uh, just led three ships through South America Strait, which became the first Europeans to sail from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And just a few decades ago, Christopher Columbus had led a fleet of three ships across the Atlantic to discover what is now the Bahamas. This is the time period we are looking at. This is before European settlement into the, um, what we call the United States or the Americas. Until this time, First Nations people were living on the land that we now call Illinois. Make no mistake about it, they were actively managing this land, but they were doing it in a different way from how we manage the land. This landscape of Illinois pre-European settlement was a land of tall grass prairies, lush woodlands and functioning wetlands and river areas. Within these ecosystems, plants, animals, microorganisms evolved together to develop a complex ecosystem of give and take amongst each other. Adaptive strategies were developed by both plants and animals. Many of these adaptive strategies co-evolved with other species. A mutually beneficial relationship was developed. Perhaps you may have heard of this, but the most well-known of these is, um, is that between pollinators and flowering plants. This relationship is what we'll be concerning ourselves with today, but I assure you there are many more. So worldwide, animals pollinate about 75% of all plant species and about 90% of all flowering plants. We all know it takes a pollinated flower to produce so many of the fruits we depend on in our human diet and enjoy in our human diet. Therefore, animal pollination is responsible for about one out of every three bites of food that we consume each day. I'm gonna say that again. Animal pollination is responsible for about one out of every three bites of food that we each enjoy each day. So early flowering plants did produce pollen, but the insects attracting nectar uh, that we commonly associate with the bloom was not part of this equation yet. It was all about the pollen. Angiosperm produced an abundance of pollen which is high in nutrition. Therefore, the insects noticed and evolution started taking place. As insect species started to use pollen for food, there was suddenly this perfect avenue for plants to uh, pollinate or to have pollination occur at a much larger scale. The feeding insects would spread pollen from plant to plant, vastly improving the plant kingdom's ability to disperse genetic information across the landscape. And they in turn would get calories so that they could continue their life cycle um, and reproduce. Nowadays, as a result of this, there's somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 species of flowering plants that make up about nine out of every 10 plants on earth. The efficiency of, of insect pollination has been proven uh, to be a mainstay in our natural world and has vastly influenced the evolution and proliferation of flowering plants around the planet. I just wanted to go through some of those things so that we make sure that we are coming at this from the same perspective of the relationship between plants and pollinators. And so now let's take a look at the pollinators, right? That was the plants and they're producing nectar and pollen. Let's consider some of the social structures of pollinators. So there are three primary social structures of pollinators. There's solitary, communal, and colony. So first, bees and wasps, uh, depending on the species, are solitary or live in colonies. Butterflies and moths are solitary. This is important when we start looking at how um, plants are pollinated. So solitary species live by themselves, where one female is responsible for rearing young. This lifestyle requires more energy expenditure on the part of the female 
to raise and rear an entire brood all on her own. In these species, flowers that provide a higher floral reward are sought. It's a work smarter, not harder method. Now in communal insect colonies, they divide and conquer the workload. A non-native species that is familiar to many of us that does this would be the honeybee. Honeybees live in communal social structures, so much so that we have been able to cultivate these species in small and large scale. Beehives, if you will. In these social structures, the insects tend to visit a large variety of flowers because they can afford to shop around due to the division of labor in which they live. Similar yet slightly different are the colonies forming, um, colony forming species, so the bumblebee. This is an example of a colony bee where multiple generations will coexist together, but they do not care for each other's young. In a communal and colony social structure, one of the benefits of this is that they will share information with one another about which flowers offer the highest rewards. This can lead to more effect, uh, effective pollination. Now, keep in mind, when I say floral rewards, I mean nectar and pollen. That's what bees and um, pollinators are after when they visit flowers. They are after that, that calorie reward. Um, and so bees are the most efficient and the most populous pollinators in our environment. And so you'll hear me say bee over and over again. Those are the ones we're going to see most in our landscape. Now, of course, there are other um, pollinators that we'll be trying to attract to our landscape, but bees are primarily um, the ones that do the most pollinating. Uh, so how bees work, they, they will collect pollen and nectar, both of them. They can make, it's called bee bread to rear their young. It's a combination of pollen and nectar. Now, due to their biological composition, bees prefer to visit open composite flowers um, with easily accessible rewards. Again, that nectar and pollen, or that nectar, excuse me. Bees tongues, and this is really fun, have tiny little spoons um, on the, they're spoon shaped um, on the tip of them. And so that allows them to lap up nectar, which is the liquid. Um, and therefore bees will visit flowers where the depth of the corolla is similar to the length of their tongue. So they'll be able to reach and physically access that nectar. This also means that they will avoid flowers where they cannot access that nectar, such as tubular flowers. Oftentimes those flowers are just too deep and they, they won't be able to reach them with their tongue. Uh, pollen on the flip side is collected with um, mouth chewing parts called mandibles. So another interesting coevolution that has occurred between bees and flowering plants is color visibility. So bees have compound eyes that see intensity, color, and polarization of light and are highly sensitive to ultraviolet light, but are red blind um, to larger, uh, longer wavelengths. This means that they cannot see the same colors that we see. They don't see like, like human, the human eye does. They don't see red, but they do see ultraviolet. What this means is that flowers have adapted uh, different coloration schemes to accommodate this. So, for example, uh, mono, a monochromatic yellow flower to us humans would be like the marsh marigold. It looks like just a single, um, single yellow flower. But to the bee, it is actually a two-tone contrast between the inner and outer flower parts um, because of ultraviolet uh, coloration. It's like a tiny runway directing bees right towards the nectar source. And so flowers have adapted these visual cues um, to help them be more visible to bees. This is important because as we'll talk about in a few minutes, when we start modifying flower color, it can have an influence on the visibility uh, to bees and to those pollinators. And so I wanna to touch on this pollinator movement. So many of us will recognize the growth and evolution of the pollinator movement. While many will argue that the movement has began, uh, started um, when Rachel Carson pro, uh, published Silent Spring in about 1962. Recent decades, we've seen a tremendous growth and awareness in the general public when it comes to pollinators and the decline of pollinator populations. So a few examples of this recent um, uptick in awareness and uh, momentum that the pollinator movement has has gained would be things like in the early 2000s, uh, conservation organizations were beginning to gain 
um, recognition and traction. So much so that the first North American pollinator protection campaign was launched. And then Deercy Society published one of the first books written for the general audience on pollinator conservation. Since then, cities um, can gain a designation as a bee city by taking steps to conserve pollinators. Um, we have seen the uh, presidential memorandum issued to create a task force to create a strategy to promote health of honeybees and other pollinators. Amid a global pandemic, a wildlife filmmaker created a full length documentary on bees in his backyard and it's now available on PBS and I do recommend it. We have seen uh, New York City convert a destined to be demolished old railroad line that is a uh, 1.45 miles in length converted from being a demolished um, piece of infrastructure into a city park, a long linear city, city park that prioritizes native plants for pollinators. And the fundraising campaign that they are, are running is where you can adopt an insect on this on the High Line. And so if that's not enough to convince you that the pollinator movement has taken off, I want to personally wish you a happy pollinator week because this week is the 15th annual pollinator week, which is an internationally celebrated week dedicated to supporting pollinator health. So happy pollinator week, my friends. So where does that leave us? Well, I believe people are good. We are good. We are trying to do our very best with what we have. We understand the fundamental need to have blooming plants available for pollinators to feed on. We understand that the transfer of pollen from stamen to pistil from one plant to another is how species are perpetuated and how genetics are shared. Being good and wanting to do something, we started planting native plants in our landscape. We went to the garden center and said, I want a plant for pollinators. I am going to save the bees. Or I need milkweed. I'm going to save the monarch. However, in all of our excitement, we didn't account for the fact that for the last forever, people have been intentionally and effectively taming nature for our use in our home landscape. This process has been done through a strategic and um, strategic art and science of plant breeding. Plant breeding is the process by which any number of scientific methods are used to create plants. The effort is done with the intent of creating an improved uh, plant according to desired outcomes and breeding goals. Plants are bred and improved for a variety of reasons, including, but not limited to, food, feed, fiber, fuel, shelter, landscape services or ecosystem services. These are all people-centered and people-defined goals and improvements. Other species have yet to be included in the equation when we are breeding um, plants. And so perhaps it was best said um, in the breeding for quantitative traits in plants by Rex Bernardo when he said, plant breeding is a genetic improvement of plants for human benefit. So as a result, the sometimes complicated process of breeding plants creates another sometimes complicated challenge. What do we use to name these plants? When we're breeding, let's consider um, native, when we're breeding native plants, what do we call them once they've become, you know, human, humans have stepped into, into plants? So first let's take humans out of the equation and consider native, the definition of a native plant. So a native plant is a plant that is developed over time in a specific region or ecosystem and generally accepted as a plant species that existed in a region prior to European settlement. And the species has gen been genetically unaltered by humans. These plants, or these species are called uh, a number of different names and you'll hear me refer to them um, perhaps in a mix of these, but they can be called species straight species, true native, wild genotype um, from seed or wild genotype from the wild. I will likely continue to refer to them as species. That is what I call them. So once genetically altered by humans, once we go through the breeding process, a native plant species that was previously mentioned as a definition of one that has not been altered by humans is no longer native. These are cultivars of native plants and are identified as such. In addition, 
um, or an additional term that has been suggested for these plants is native var, an obvious combination of native and cultivar. Um, Plantsman Alan Armitage is the one that recommended this um, this new language for for native plants that have been cultivated. I have not seen um, wide acceptance of this term, but it's out there. So I wanted to share that with you all today. So keep in mind also that there is what I like to think of as shades of cultivar development. So in theory, two species related to each other found in the same ecosystem could naturally hybridize and create an offspring that is genetically a blend of the two parent species. Oaks are famous for doing this naturally. Are the offspring cultivars? Not really, because humans are not involved. When we intentionally cross two species that could, in theory, naturally cross-pollinate, is it still a straight species uh, native? Then there are the hybrids, only are possible due to human intervention. So think street spire oak, a hybrid of an English oak and a white oak. English oak is native to Europe, North Africa, West Asia. White oak is native to the Eastern Canada and United States. Without human intervention, these two species would not hybridize. This is a clear example of a cultivar that is not native. So when we look at these native cultivars, we know what we like and we know what we have bred these plants to meet you know, a certain definition of improvement. But what about the pollinators that we have developed these mutually beneficial relationships with these species? What happens when the species is modified? Let's take a look. So unfortunately, the research available on this topic is limited um, and replicated studies have not been done extensively. The limited amount of research I have found on this topic um, analyze data in ways that are useful in giving us some insight into the potential results, um, but farther, uh, further study needs to be done. Um, Another challenge of these is that the studies are diverse enough in subject matter that comparisons are limited. Several studies considered frequency of visits to flowers by, at the family level, demonstrating, for example, Fabaceae is favored by honeybees and some wild bees, while other bees prefer other species. Um, other studies have indicated that wild bees prefer to forage on native plants but this is not exclusive conclusion because others suggest that there's no preferential difference between native and non-native species. And then another found a negative effect of pollinator visits when non-native plants were present and had similar flower phenology, especially uh, flower um, symmetry and color. So the moderate conclusion of this body of work is that native plants are generally preferred over non-native species, yet non-native species will be visited by pollinators when adequate supplies of native sources are available or flower morphology mimics native plants. The limited amount of research also indicates a need for further study. So as horticulturists and gardeners, our home landscape is often our planting area of choice. Today, I want to explore the results of one study that sought to compare the attractiveness of native, cult uh, native cultivars to their straight species counterparts. I am particularly interested in this comparison because this gets to the heart of our predicament as home growers. We wanna grow a landscape that meets all of our traditional criteria for beauty, interest, color, plant size, et cetera, and provides nutrition for pollinators. This is the only study I am aware of that does this side-by-side -side comparison of a species to a cultivar. I understand there is ongoing research in this area, but has not been published. So today we're gonna to be exploring the results of this study um, and talking about some of the lessons that we might be able to take um, from these comparisons. So first, a brief overview of the study. So it started in uh, 2012 in Vermont. The observations that are reported in the study um, were done in 2013 and 2014. Two sites, uh, two separate sites were selected for the, for the study, 11 specimens, um, were selected. So 11 uh, native plants um, and then a counterpart to those 11 species were, were selected. They were planted side by side. A randomized complete block design was used um, to observe these plants, basically a big grid pattern 
uh, randomized complete block design is a pretty standard agricultural um, method of studying uh, you know, uh, plant results. So uh, the selected native species were paired with a cultivated variety. Some of them were seed selections, meaning that they grew from a, um, they were grown from a seed and can occur in, na in nature. And some of them had flower color change, others had leaf color change. There was, uh, the researcher tried, um, noted that she had tried to have a wide variety of changes to observe. Observations were done uh, using a visual observation method with set parameters of conditions when most pollinators were likely to be active. So they were observed at set times of the day for set durations. Um, because this is a visual observation, no species, no um, insects were captured during uh, the observations. So they were grouped in generalized categories, such as um, all species of bumblebees, honeybees, small dark bees. Um, there were seven categories of bees, a group of Lepidoptera, a group of beetles, a group of flies, and a group of bugs. So that's um, just how the research breaks down. I won't get into too many of the um, details of that. Um, as we're re reporting the results, but I just wanted you to know how that study um, was set up. Perhaps you're interested in replicating it. Uh, so the uh, results indicate that insects do prefer to forage on native species over cultivars, but as we will see, this is not a consistent statement for all species. This suggests that some native cultivars may be comparable substitutions in a landscape setting where the goal is to accommodate both pollinators and our aesthetic desires. The mixed results indicate that there's much more research that needs to be done and a greater understanding is needed for how um, changes or modifications to these species impact um, pollinator preference. So um, as a caveat, I just wanted to note that this photo here is of an echinacea, this is a cultivar. Um, echinacea was not considered in this study, but it is a very popular plant that has been cultivated and is available in a variety of floral colors and forms. I included it here because I wanted to um, uh, just make note that I know echinacea is very popular. Um, and so maybe we can glean some information about what echinacea might be more pot or more beneficial to um, pollinators than others through these studies, but it's not included, unfortunately. because I um, personally am very curious about echinacea cultivars. Okay, so results. Um, Achillea millifolium, which is yarrow. So the straight species flowers are white with a pale yellow, ce yellow center. It is shown here. The cultivar that was compared was called strawberry seduction. Strawberry, or excuse me, strawberry select, yeah, seduction. <laughs> strawberry seduction um, is derived from a repeated selection. It's a highly human involved process from seed from the cultivar summer pastels. Uh, the industry text describes the, the flowers of strawberry uh, seduction as being long-lasting, clusters of rich velvety red flowers with bright gold centers, so um, a floral color change. The floral form is still at flat topped umbel and that did not change during cultivation. And the observation results indicated a strong preference for the straight species at a nearly 12 to 1 ratio. Bees and flies visited the species most. Bees visited the straight species at nearly twice the rate of flies. And this percentage swapped for the cultivar with nearly twice as many flies visiting it as bees. Now keep in mind, you know, going back to what we had talked about earlier, the bees don't see red. That might be part of the, um, part of the discrepancy between uh, bee visits or bee preferences uh, to the, to the um, strawberry seduction. All right, Anise Hissop. Uh, the cultivar that was considered here was called Golden Jubilee. And now Golden Jubilee produces lavender bottle brush blooms similar to the straight species. The straight species is shown here. Uh, the modification or the selection was made to have lighter green foliage than the straight species or chartreuse colored foliage. The observation results indicated that bee species showed no strong preference for the straight species or the cultivar. Beetles and bugs, however, did um, exhibit a preference for the straight species. It is hypothesized that the lack of floral phenology and morphology changes from the species to cultivar limited the reduced variation of preferences among pollinators. 
Generally, we understand the floral characteristics impact pollinator appeal much more than the foliage characteristics, and therefore, a cultivar selection based on foliage modification may not have as great of an impact on pollinator appeal. Oh, Asclepias tuberosa, or butterfly milkweed. Uh, the cultivar that was considered in this study was called Hello Yellow. And so Hello Yellow is a bright yellow bloom where the species has this bright orange bloom. Other plant characteristics remain the same um, from the cultivar to the species. So the observation results indicated no strong preference differentiation uh, from the straight species over the cultivar by bees or other pollinator groups. In fact, during the study, Hello Yellow received more visits by pollinators than the straight species at a nearly two to one or three to two ratio. So additional research is gonna be needed to better understand the significance of these results um, and if they can be replicated. But what this potentially indicates is that the yellow color is more visible to bees than orange. We recall the bees, you know, again, um, don't see red wavelengths. And on the color spectrum, yellow is farther removed from red than orange. So the slight variation may have contributed to a higher frequency of visits, but we need to we need to continue to study and see what is um, what the results truly indicate. All right, Aptichia australis, so false indigo. Twilight is the the cultivar that was considered here. So twilight is a bicolor Baptisia. That is a result of a controlled crossbreeding between Baptisia australis and Baptisia seferocarpa. I believe I said that right. <laughs> um, correct me in the box, in the text box if I, I didn't. But um, both of these species are native to the United States, but their native distribution ranges cross only in a small area. So um, Australis is native, has a wide distribution throughout Eastern and Central um, United States, while seferocarpa is native only to the central or south central United States. So the overlapping range is Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. Additionally, the bloom time on these two species overlap, but Australis is um, blooms a little earlier, May to July, where Seferocarpa blooms in June and July. Therefore, technically, um, it would be possible for these two plants to cross pollinate in the natural world and create a hybrid twilight. If this were to happen, the next generation would likely not demonstrate the same characteristics of twilight due to genetic mixing. And so the propagation of um, these cultivars, many of these cultivars is through vegetative propagation. So I mentioned that these two points, both the, um, the distribution range and the bloom time to help illustrate the complexity of native plant um, cultivars. Um, as I previously mentioned, that language is a little bit muddy and murky. I didn't actually answer the question of whether um, a naturally occurring hybridization that humans intervened with would still be native. Um, I will let you all debate that um, at the dinner table tonight. Um, but regardless of the name that we're, we're calling it, we are trying to attract pollinators to our landscape. So we want to analyze these cultivars um, on that basis. So pollinators, in particular bumblebees, showed a preference for the species. Um, but it is not recommended as an adequate substitution. So. Um, I do regret, I don't have a photo of Twilight. Um, from a quick internet search, it appeared that the blossoms have a deeper, rich lavender, um, kind of a rust color to them than the bright, bold color of the, the straight species. This might have influenced visibility and appeal to the pollinators. Um, again, I'm gonna say this a number of times, we need to know more about this and need to continue to study. Um, but it might also have something to do with um, the floral reward, that's a point we haven't mentioned yet before. Um, we don't know how um, nectar production is impacted by these hybrid um, crosses. And so that's a kind of a next level study that needs to be done. Um, but this one, um, they did show a strong preference for the, the straight species. Okay, Monarda fistulosa, uh, Claire Grace. Uh, this is an example of a cultivar that was selected for reasons not related to the bloom display. So powdery mildew can be a challenge with the straight species of Monarda uh, fistulosa, and it can make it a really undesirable plant for like a formalized landscape setting. Uh, this selection was developed in the Southern United States. So in addition to having a higher um, resistance level for powdery mildew, it's also a little more uh, drought tolerant. It also um, 
is slightly less cold resistant. It's okay um, from what the literature says, it's still a zone four, so it would be a suitable, um, it would survive in Illinois, um, but it just loses just a little bit of hardiness because of that, that hybridization. So the flowers of Claire Grace uh, are slightly darker, more of a pink hue than the species, but the plant height, the bloom, the bloom time and duration um, are all very similar um, to the, the straight species. Uh, study results show um, no strong preference for the species Claire Grace. Bumblebees are predominant pollinator of both. And so in this two location study, the combination analysis of the, of the data did indicate no significant results were produced. However, site A did demonstrate that all pollinators prefer the straight species. Um, so mixed results, um, more analysis is going to be needed to understand the results, but um, you know, extrapolating from other um, information that we have we have seen, that change in, in floral bloom, um, I would suspect that perhaps there's no major difference, but again, we need to do some more study. All right, Pensamen digitalis. So this is Husker red in this, in this picture. Husker red is a um, smaller plant than the straight species and the leaves are red. They emerge red in the spring. This is a little late in the season. You can still see hints of the red in the, um, in the photo here. But um, those red leaves eventually do fade to green as the season progresses. It is after um, the, the flower display has, has set. So it blooms in mid to early spring, or excuse me, mid spring to early summer. Um, and the flowers are tubular in shape. Um, so likely not attracting, um, you know, uh, bees or, or things that have a very short tongue. Um, but they develop in shades of pink. They're, they're very comparable. The blossoms of Husker Red are very comparable to um, the white flowers of the straight species. Um, so native bees, bumblebees, and other pollinators showed no preference between the two species. Um, Non-native bees did demonstrate a stronger preference for the straight species. Um, Husker Red appears to be an equivalent um, substitution for the native species to support um, native pollinators. All right, um, Black-Eyed Susan. So um, Black-Eyed Susan is native to areas with uh, more moist soil profiles in the like, east of the Mississippi River. Goldstrom is the cultivar that was analyzed in the study and the selection um, is more compact in size and more coarse than the straight species. And so, and Goldstrom also has a shorter bloom time. Initial results indicate that there is no um, category of pollinator that shows a significant difference between the species and the cultivar. So this indicates to us that Goldstrom may be a suitable substitution for the species if you uh, consider the shorter bloom time, right? So you would have a shorter um, window of nectar and pollen availability um, with, this, with the cultivar, but the preference there um, there's no difference between the cultivar and the um, straight species. And then Ohio spiderwort, so Triscanthia ohioensis. Um, it's an adaptable native with wide distribution in the east of Missouri. Mine are blooming just phenomenally right now here in northern um, Illinois. Uh, the straight species has brilliant purple bluish blooms that open in the, in the early morning and then they close up in the heat of the day. Red grape is the cultivar that we're considering here. And this is the result of a very complicated breeding process where three species were crossed multiple times to produce the end result. So the three species um, involved in this hybridization, they share native distribution um, in the Southeast, but this complex cross uh, requires cultivation to produce. It requires human input. Um, so it could not occur, uh, or it would be extremely unlikely to occur naturally. Uh, so during observation, bees, both honey and native, were primarily were the primary pollinators of spiderwort. These and all other pollinators observed um, demonstrated a preference for the species um, over the cultivar at a two to one ratio. A few characteristics uh, worth noting about the cultivar uh, red grape is that the floral abundance is significantly less than the species, but the bloom time is substantially longer. So when considering the larger picture of the ecosystem function and, the comp and in a complex setting um, or complex planting, 
to support pollinators, it may be that the extended bloom time of red grapes counteracts the reduced floral abundance, um, bridging gaps between you know, different seasons of, of different blooming plants. And so the initial results, uh, it is not recommended that red grape be a substitute for, um, for the straight species, but uh, more information would be enlightening, um, especially given that longer bloom time. I see in the chat box, yes, the, the, red uh, the top picture here is the red grape cultivar. So you can see the color difference. And so last, but certainly not least, we consider seasweed. Um, a colleague of mine said that the name is, um, would deter folks from it. I assure you, I have this in my landscape and it is a lovely, um, I, I do not get the sneezes when I go near this plant, but let's compare it and how pollinators um, look at it. So Morham Beauty is the, the cultivar that was um, compared here. So this is a hybrid that was uh, produced in a controlled cross of Helenium autumnale and Helenium bigolvia. Bigolvia um, is native to the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Coast. And so this one, um, not native to the um, central United States or Illinois, it blooms in the summer. And so the species of Helenium autumnale, um, as the name suggests, blooms yellow in August to October in the autumn. Um, so the result of this, this cultivar, this crossing, is a reddish bronze bloom in midsummer. Um, in this study, when they were grown side by side, there were no bloom time overlap. So the, the bloom time was, was varied from the native plant um, to the cultivar. And so observations um, are, the results are limited in the information that they can give us because um, varying competing floral resources may have affected pollinator visitation. Other blooming plants during those two different seasons may have influenced um, at different rates the appeal of um, the cultivar or the um, straight species. And so the, um, the results are, are unique from other um, cultivars that were compared to straight species. This is also significant and of note because the change in the bloom time um, if you're trying to attract pollinators, we need to consider their life cycle. And as, um, as the seasons progress through the growing season, the availability of foraging opportunities um, can mean the difference between life and death, can mean the difference between reproducing or not reproducing, or um, in some cases, migrating or not. A floral abundance um, that occurs in the earlier season matches up with a larger um, quantity of plants that we have available in our native plant palette. Early and late blooming plants are more limited than peak season blooming plants. And so substituting a cultivar with an earlier bloom time would not be recommended if pollinator um, forage is what you are trying to achieve in your landscape. It would just be blooming too soon and they would not have resources um, later in the season. So in summary, preliminary studies indicate that for the most part, straight species are preferred by pollinators. However, cultivars may, um, may be a suitable substitution if evaluated on a plant by plant basis. Cultivars are often selected for the characteristics that make them more appealing to home gardeners or to municipal workers or to people, just people um, in general. They may be more predictable, they may be more uniform, more disease resistant, or in more manageable form. They may also meet certain aesthetic goals or um, that the straight species does not. In addition, cultivars are sometimes easier to propagate and are easier to carry in a nursery industry. Conversely, straight species may have adaptive characteristics that make them better suited for the local ecosystem, including tolerance to the climate and soil conditions. This can increase longevity and resiliency in the landscape, um, and it can lower maintenance input uh, demands such as water. Finally, the use of straight species helps maintain genetic diversity through open pollination. Remember, the majority of cultivars are propagated vegetatively, meaning that they're all clones. They're all of the exact same genetic makeup. So what is our conclusion? Well, it is that we don't yet have a full picture of how cultivars compare to species when it comes to pollinator preference. It appears that species are preferred, uh, but cultivars are visited by pollinators. 
the study and others also indicate that there is not going to be a singular conclusion for the question at hand. It appears that there's going to be, um, we're going to need to evaluate um, things on a species by species basis, if not a cultivar by cultivar basis. So what do we do? We still want to help pollinators. We still want to have a beautiful landscape with all our favorite aesthetic characteristics. And you all probably attended this webinar thinking you were going to get the answers. And we're just told that the answer is, it depends. So before you give up all hope and frustration, allow me to share a few thoughts. Regardless of what you are planting, these studies show us and others show us that pollinators do visit non-native and native cultivar species. So using cultivars of native plants in our landscape is very likely still going to provide forage resources for pollinators. It may not be the gold standard, but a flowering native cultivar will be much more useful to a pollinator than a non-flowering or wind pollinated plant, such as a grass species from a pollen and nectar resource perspective. Um, if the flower form allows for those calories to be accessed. Furthermore, planting native cultivars that maintain a close floral display to the straight species seems to be more attractive um, and or more visible to pollinators than the highly modified floral displays of cultivars. I'd go back to our beginning conversation about the color spectrum and the visibility of pollinators and the mouth part biology. So being able to access pollen or access um, nectar is going to be a um, deciding factor for most um, pollinators in visiting in visiting your um, the plants in your garden. So second, incorporating a variety of plants in our landscape can provide um, blooms all year long. That will provide more foraging resources for pollinators. So the minimum recommendation is to plant three blooming species per season. Personally, I would emphasize that that is a minimum. Of course, more species of plants blooming throughout all the seasons is going to serve more pollinator species. And then don't forget about trees and shrubs. Annuals and perennials are not the only plants that provide pollen and nectar resources for pollinators. Some of our earliest blooming plants are trees and shrubs. So incorporating these into our landscape can help provide those very early season um, calories that pollinators need. Fourth, culturally adopt a no or minimum pesticide use approach for your landscape. Many pesticides that we use to, in our landscapes to get rid of the undesirable pests, excuse me, undesirable pests are non-target specific, meaning that they will also impact the beneficial insects. These same insects that we are trying to plant flowers for. So, and while you're at it in, in minimizing pesticide use, be a messy gardener. Leave patches of undisturbed bare ground on the ground uh, for nesting pollinators. Leave plant, mater plant material stubble in the garden until late spring to avoid inadvertently removing insects that are overwintering in the spent plant material from the previous season. And perhaps even tolerate a few weeds in your landscape, such as violets and dandelions. These provide foraging opportunities for pollinators as well. And finally, stay curious. Take what we've talked about today here and use it to inform your plant choices and your plant purchases. Continue to seek new information. This is an emerging field of research and of, of um, data. Keep, keep seeking it out. Stay in touch with Extension. We're happy to continue to provide some of these, um, this resource. Um, and also just keep doing your best. Every little bit matters. And I would encourage you not to let perfection be the enemy of progress. And so again, I thank you all for your time and attention today. Um, the session has been recorded and will be posted for viewing later. So if you missed anything or want to go back and revisit anything, um, it'll be recorded or it'll be um, posted on this website here. And then I ask kindly that you either use your smart device and scan this QR code and complete a, a short survey, or you can go to uh, the link here. And I believe Nancy's going to put it in our chat box. Um, that helps me know. Um, how I did, what you all are curious about, what um, what we think um, or how we can best serve you all. So I will leave that slide up there for a few more minutes and then I will advance so you have my email um, information, but we can take some questions now. Excellent, Emily, well done. Very eye-opening and I appreciate it. 
Um, one, the first question I saw that came up was, um, could you repeat the title and maybe where you could find that PBS um, uh, video on pollinators? Oh, I caught it on PBS. <laughs> um, how about, um, I will advance to the next slide. Shoot me an email and I'll find a link to it um, and send it to you. Um, that would be great. Marilyn, yeah. I know you sent me a direct message. If you could um, email Emily and she will get that yep. link to you. Yeah. And this and is Emily's email here. Yeah. And if, yeah, before you sign off, um, I did put the link into the evaluation and I'll follow up with an email. So please provide your, your feedback.